This is, uh, like you've heard, the fourth week of a series we've called The Face of God. The idea being that to know somebody, like to really know them, you got to spend some face-to-face time with them. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11 tells us that we're to seek the Lord's face always. But how do you seek somebody you can't see? Well, that's where the Bible comes in. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels, are these uh, pictures of the attributes, the character traits, the person of Jesus. And the more we study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, The more it's like getting a sit down, like you're getting a coffee, you're chatting with Jesus over lunch, you get some face to face time with him. So that's our heart today. That's our heart in this service uh, or in this series, rather, that you'd see a little bit more of Jesus. You'd see the humanity of Christ. You'd see the kingship of Christ. You'd see the servant uh, nature of Christ and, of course, the divinity of Jesus. I want to jump right into a great Bible story, Matthew chapter 4. And verse 1 says this, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No kidding. The tempter came to some of you. You you did like 21 days with us in January. And, you know, I know know how these things go. Because you start out like, man, all water. Then by lunch on the first day, you're like, liquids. I'm going to have some smoothies. Then by dinner, you're like just salads with light protein. Like, I get it. Jesus said, like, you're ready to gouge somebody's eyes out after a few hours. Jesus is out here 40 days. The tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written... He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I just want to point out, it's not really part of the message, but one of the devil's tactics has always been to distort Scripture. And so you're, you'll hear a lot of people right now saying things like, yeah, well, but the Bible says this or the Bible says that, and they're cherry-picking verses to fit an agenda. you got to be really careful that Because what sounds scriptural and what might be a verse might not be biblical. You have to explore the whole context. The devil is a master deceiver. Jesus answered him, said, it's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down <clears throat> and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Let's pray for a moment. Jesus, thank you uh, that we're here today. Thank you that we've gathered in both locations. God, thank you that you're speaking to our hearts. We've already been in your presence and worshiping and our faith is being strengthened but we ask now that you challenge us from your word help us to become more like your son in jesus name amen um i don't want to talk about it (laughs) i know you're waiting i generally start with some sort of sports commentary Um, i hate sports i hate hockey It's a waste of time. I don't want anybody to win. I want the whole thing to fold. I'm just not, I'll get there. I'm just not strong enough to be there right now. Okay, so just let me, just let me grieve. And uh, listen, you're a Flames fan. We played seven more games than you did. So, okay, but I'll talk about it for just a minute. Um, Things change so quickly, right? Like, Last Sunday, you were all doubters like I was. And, and this is the nature of sport. I mean, the Leafs were down three to one, and it was wild. And, and so uh, none of us thought they had any chance. We all thought it was over. But then they won game five. And you're like, so you're telling me there's a chance. You know, you're into it. And then they won game six. You're like, they are God's team. 
It's the year of destiny. And, and I felt a little bit embarrassed because my wife uh, shared a video on social media of a bunch of us cheering after the game six win. And we were high-fiving and hugging and yelling and celebrating. And listen, that you know a starving fan base. When you're celebrating like that over nothing. <laughs> that wasn't a series win. That wasn't a cup final. We didn't even make it to the next round. We were excited. And then you, last night, watching. It's the third period. Game's tied. One shot will change everything. The Leafs are out shooting their opponent. Then all of a sudden, the Leafs score. And at my house, it was insanity. We're like, <sighs> like every, like I'm, I'm a grown man. I'm jumping. I'm hugging people. I'm spinning Natasha around. Like, and it's, it's this beautiful moment. And the, so you're kind of like, they're going to do it. It's halfway through the third period. It's going to happen. God's team. And a minute and 21 seconds later, the devil. <laughs> Clearly, they were being controlled by some dark forces. And then, boom, Boston scores. And so then it's tied 1-1. And you're like, okay, one shot away. And so you're kind of still sitting on the edge, of the, uh, edge of your seat. It goes into overtime, and the Leafs get some chances. You're like, oh, this is it. And then, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay, here's the point. Things change quickly. Like it was elation and then devastation. So fast. It's, it's uh, well, the Lambert men. Went to bed with tears in their eyes. We're not even ashamed about it. We're passionate men. I, I was thinking about how quickly things go from this to that. How quickly you can be up and then all of a sudden. And as I was looking at Matthew chapter 4, I realized that the, the passage is bookended by the word then. In verse 1... It says, then Jesus was led. In, in verse 11, it says, then the devil left. Jesus was led, then the devil left. Then, it, it, it happens quickly, then. We looked last week at the baptism of Jesus. You know, he's obedient, God speaks his beautiful affirmation over him and the Holy Spirit comes on him and he's got uh, peace and things are good and, and it's just like celebratory moment. And then in Matthew's gospel, it goes right from uh, God saying the words, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The very next word is then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil then. Things change quickly. You can be here and then. You can have something and then. Think about Jesus in this particular situation. Uh, he goes from the Spirit's baptism. Then he's in a spiritual battle. It happens quick. He's hearing a voice from heaven. Then he's navigating a voice from hell. It happened fast. He's got comfort and then all of a sudden he's in conflict. And it happened quickly. He's in the water, coming up out of the water in his baptism, and then he's in the wilderness. There's refreshment, and then it's dry and weary and barren. There's joy and strength, and he's being celebrated. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and then he's hungry, weak, and tired. Then, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus being led. When I read about the baptism of Jesus, and I'm digging into it, and I'm looking at the story, I expect Jesus to go right from this amazing moment of baptism. It's his introduction to the public stage. I'm expecting him to go from this right into his public ministry. Uh, like, he comes up out of the water. Okay, I'm ready. 
I'm ready to go. I'm ready to step into my calling. I've been baptized. God loves me. You all heard it. He spoke to me from heaven. That's pretty amazing. And I'm expecting the next thing we read about Jesus to be miracles and preaching, like the highlight reel stuff. I'm expecting that he would step into the stage and the place of his life where he's redeeming people and restoring people and fulfilling the reason he came. But instead, instead of being led to a platform, instead of being elevated, instead of being led to crowds where he's preaching and teaching, instead of being led into a new opportunity, he's led into the wilderness. Why was Jesus led into the wilderness? I think Jesus was led into the wilderness for the same reason that he was led into the waters of baptism, because he had to be an example for us. So he goes into the waters of baptism to say, hey, I'm willing to be obedient. I'm willing to take your place in death so you can have my place in life. And then before Jesus starts his public ministry, he goes into the wilderness as if to say, even I will submit to a season of preparation. Jesus had to put in the work. And when it says that the devil came and tempted him, the, the word tempt is translated other places in scripture as tested and tried. Before Jesus could start doing the very thing that God had created him to do, he needed to be tested. And he's drawn out into the wilderness where he's alone. He fasts for 40 days, which is an incredible physical strain. Uh, his physical needs would be, would be a raging on the inside of him. It's a psychological strain. That's actually why we fast. We put ourselves into a deficit. We create a physical need that forces us to develop self-control. And so he, he puts himself into this situation where he's physically desperate, he had to do, it's training, it's preparation, because what God had planned for him was not going to be easy. And, and in between the baptism of Christ and the temptation of Christ, we see both him as this divine person recognized by God the Father, filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We see the divinity of Christ in his baptism. We see the humanity of Christ in that he's tempted, the Bible says, just as we were. He's being tempted. There were going to be moments when he would be alone in his ministry and had to choose to do the right thing, which is why he's led to a place where he's alone. There would be moments when his body, his desires, everything in him is screaming to change the situation. Imagine the pain of hanging on the cross, knowing you've got the power to step off and be pain-free, but choosing to stay because God said, that's what I need you to do. He's training himself to fulfill the call of God. There would be moments when he's isolated and things are difficult and it's hot and it's uncomfortable. And there's a test because Jesus is showing and demonstrating that even he needs to be prepared to live purpose under pressure. It's important for us, not just that we follow Christ in baptism, but that we know how to follow him into wilderness. Because your life is not all blessing and baptism. We had a, man, if you're here for the first time or maybe you weren't in one of our rooms last week, we had an amazing Sunday. It was like an all-time Sunday. And you know what I love is that we just keep having these all-time Sundays because like six weeks ago, I was like, man, that's an all-time Sunday. Then we had Easter, I was like, whew, all-time Sunday. So we're just on this run of like all-time Sundays. And it's like how every time LeBron scores a basket right now, the, the all-time leading scorer record gets Larger and larger and larger. He's just, I don't like LeBron. I'm just using him as a spiritual example, okay? But it's just all time. It just keeps getting better. We're just going from like, whoa, one high to another high. It was amazing. The rooms were packed. We had 122 baptisms across both locations, and which is wild. It's amazing. Not only that, on Wednesday night, we had revival night, and a bunch of, a bunch of other people were like, hey, haven't been baptized yet, so we kept the tub out. We cleaned the water because it was really bad after Sunday, <laughs> but a, a, a lot, we were worshiping on Wednesday night, and people just, whoosh, yeah. it was incredible. It was, in many ways, for many people, a high point spiritually. Now, you might not have been baptized last week, but Sundays might be a bit of a high point spiritually for you. That's why you come. You feel refreshed. You feel energized. You feel like, man... I can do it. You, you connect your faith and your strength and in your relationship with God as you join with other people. Um, 
but life is not all blessing and baptism. So as fun as it was, maybe you got baptized last week and you come up out of the water and there are hundreds of people at your location cheering and screaming for you. It's like, man, you come up out of the water to all the applause and the celebration and the man, that's amazing. And then you go to work on Monday and nobody cares. I got baptized. Oh, that's weird. Like they just... Like you walk into church and be like, I'm feeling kind of down today. You'll have 10 people around you in five seconds. Hey, let's pray. We want to lift you up. Our shields of faith together. Going to work. Hey, I'm feeling kind of stressed out. Suck it up. It's just like, it's, you can go from like this one moment of like, whoa, amazing. And then this happens quick. Then might be a good word to describe your week. It was kind of a week of like then. Like I love being in the room and I felt encouraged, but I felt close to God. Things were good, but then, man, there's this real struggle at work. I was feeling confident in who I am, and then I really connected with God in worship, and I was feeling uh, sure of my identity, but then I got home, and I started wrestling with doubt and fear and insecurity. Um, I know for sure there were people in this room on Sunday, and then we walked out. Then you had to go visit a friend who's dying in the hospital. Then you had somebody try to take their life. Then you had a blow up with your spouse. Then you turned back to the habit that you thought, man, I'm in the water. Surely I'll never do that again. And then you come up, you think, man, I'm raised to life in Christ. And then a couple of days later, you're right back where you thought you'd never be. Then. Did, just, just know this. That if Jesus had to do it, you will get through it. If Jesus had to do it. If Jesus had to go into the wilderness, if Jesus had to be tempted by the devil, if Jesus had to face him alone and hungry and tired and worn out, if he had to do it, he only did it so that you and I would know, man, I can get through that. But the devil doesn't fight fair. He waits until Jesus has been 40 days with no food, and then he shows up. Because he's looking for an opportune time to try and get you. You know when he's not going to attack you? Generally, here. You're with your people. You got some people around you. You're feeling good. You're feeling encouraged. You know when he's going to come? He's going to come get you when you're hungry. That's why you got to go for lunch right away. <laughs> Don't let your guard down. Jesus, I need that drive through I cannot let my guard down. He's coming after you when it's late and you know you should be in bed with your spouse. He's coming after, after you when you're tired because work's been exhausting and it's stressful and you're trying to manage a project and you're just, ah. He's coming after you when you feel frustrated and defeated. He's coming after you when you're alone. He does not fight fair. He tries to take advantage of you when you are vulnerable. And so Jesus, even in vulnerability, is an example. Now, every time I've read the story about the temptation of Jesus, and, and it's a fascinating story, and it's an important story. The reason I know it's important is because all four Gospels include it. Um, it, it even when you contrast it with the birth of Christ, um, only Matthew and Luke talk about the birth of Christ. Mark and John weren't much for baby showers. So they're like, forget about it. Let's just get to the good stuff. We don't like babies. But every Gospel tells this story. Because every writer wants you to know there is no purpose without preparation. Every writer wants to make sure, I got to make sure that if the only account of the life of Christ somebody reads is the one that I'm writing, I need them to know that you can't just go from baptism to like live in your best life. There's going to be a process in between and there's going to be a constant trying and testing of your faith. I need them to know. And so I've always read the story and thought, that there were three tests. I thought there were three tests. The devil comes and tempts Jesus with these three different questions and situations. And so I've always thought, man, how do I got to get ready for the three tests? I need to know the answer to the three. And I'll, even when I was looking at this text to bring it here, I thought, man, I, I need to make sure that we all know how to respond to the three tests. And then I looked at it again, and I realized there's only one test 
and it determines the outcome of all the temptations. There's only one test. So if, if I just started talking tests, you started sweating, you're like, can I copy the person beside me? Uh, you don't know how you're going to remember three things. I'm going to make it simple. One question that we all have to be able to answer. One question. And Mark's version of the story, it, he hits hard. He doesn't have all the details Matthew has, but it says in Mark chapter 1, verse 27, the spirit immediately, or sorry, 27, what I'm talking about, Mark 1, 12, uh, the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He wasn't just led, he was driven. Jesus was driven into the wilderness. What does it mean to be driven by something? To be operated, moved, controlled by a person or a power. Here's the question that everybody needs to answer. What's driving you? If you get the answer to what's driving you right, you'll be able to navigate whatever temptation the devil throws at you. But if you're not being driven by the right thing, then you'll drive into the ditch every time you get tempted. The real question we need to answer, what's driving you what drives you jesus was driven by the holy spirit jesus did not want to, to head into the desert for 40 days alone with no food i'm sure after his baptism he wanted to do what all you guys wanted to do go to opa party with some tzatziki that's what jesus wanted to do after his baptism hey guys let's go get some food it's my baptism day Jesus wasn't being driven by what he wanted. He was being driven by the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between being driven by what you desire and being driven by what God desires, by the Spirit. Before Jesus could begin his public ministry, before he could step into everything God planned for him, he had to prove, hey, in my life, I am willing for the Holy Spirit to be in the driver's seat. I want to be driven by the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to be driven by my own ambition. I'm not going to be driven by my own goals. I'm not going to be driven by my own desires. I'm going to be driven by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the real temptation of life will be to let something else or somebody else drive. And the real temptation for us, if we're not careful, and, and this is like a... Um, you know, when we got into this series, I was, we've just been kind of uh, a little bit different than some of the other ones we do. Because a lot of times, and most of the time, we actually preach through the stories chronologically, or at least in the order that they're written. But we've been jumping around a little bit more based on what we feel the pastoral needs of our community are. And I want to make sure that after having a spiritually high moment, we don't become Christians who chase spiritually high moments. It, being a Christian is not about chasing a spiritual moment. I'm not driven by going from one moment to the next. I'm not driven just to be in the room on Sunday or to be in the room on Wednesday. I'm not driven to run after spiritual moments. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is submission to a spiritual master. It's different. I like to drive. I don't like other people driving me. I, uh, I don't know what you have negotiated in your marriage, but in my house, I drive, and I think that's the way it should be. <laughs> Again, you do whatever works for you. I'm the driver. We get into the car. It is assumed that I will take position behind the wheel, and I will get us there quickly and safe enough. I like to drive. I just, I feel like when I'm not driving, I feel like, I, well, I'm not in control. I, I'm scared. I get worried. I, and it's not that I don't trust my wife. But, well, this week, we had to go out this week. And I was in, I was, as you can imagine, I just want you to appreciate the, the situation I found myself in. Is that there was a Leaf game on. We had to leave the house. I thought, okay, I'm going to watch the hockey game on my phone and if I drive and watch the hockey game, it will not be safe. So I thought, I'm going to watch the hockey game. That's the only thing I knew for sure was going to happen. I thought, 
if Natasha drives and I watch the hockey game, we're not safe. But, <laughs> but, but not as safe, no, I'm just saying not as safe as when I'm driving. But I, I just weighed the pros and cons quickly and I thought, here's the upside. If I'm watching the game and driving and I get into an accident, I'm going to get a very large ticket for distracted driving, and it's not a good example to my kids. But if I'm watching the game and Natasha's driving and we get into an accident, she'll get a ticket. I'm fine. <laughs> so I just, it was very calculated. I let her drive, but I wouldn't say it was smooth. It was, you know, it's kind of stressful. And listen, for the, I gave her a little bit of feedback, and she was bothered at me while we were driving. But if you knew, if you knew the amount of times that she starts praying in tongues as I'm slowing up to a red light at a very normal and acceptable rate, like you would understand. <laughs> Do we, we like to, whether you like to drive the car or not, I know this, you like to drive your life. You like to be the one in control. And so the real barrier between me, between you, and our purpose is not calling. You're called. It's not ability. You're able. It's not gifts. You've got some. It's not talents. God's given those to you as well. It's not opportunity, and it's especially not other people. And I'll just side, sidebar here. We need to stop blaming other people for where we aren't. Well, I would be further ahead if it wasn't for this person and that person and this situation and that situation. Listen, nobody can stand in the way of what God wants to do in your life except for you. It's no one else's fault if you're not where God says he wants to take you. What drives you will define you. And so the real question, the real test, the real thing we need to do as we navigate seasons of preparation and wilderness is know who is driving me? Who's in control of my life? What person or power? What is motivating my decisions and my actions? Who's driving? Every time Jesus is tempted by the devil, it's really about who's driving. It says the tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, before we unpack this specific temptation, when Jesus responds to the devil, we need to note that he's responding using scripture from the, bro the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. In fact, he quotes Deuteronomy 5 once and he quotes Deuteronomy 6 twice. Now, why is that important? We're not going to go back and read Deuteronomy because Jesus quotes it. So we've got it right there. This is important because of what it connects the moment of Jesus's temptation to. Because the book of Deuteronomy was written while the Israelites were in the wilderness wandering. And so when Jesus starts responding with Deuteronomy, if we hadn't already made the association between Jesus being led into the wilderness and the fact that the Israelites were led and wandered in the wilderness, we surely should make that connection now. It is parallel. Let me bring you up to speed on the Exodus story. Basically what happened was the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. They're all but dead. No future, no peace, no hope, no life, no purpose. God delivers them by raising up a man named Moses who leads them out of captivity, delivers them into their future, going through the water of the Red Sea. Now they come up on the other side of the water and what's there to meet them but a cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire in the nighttime to lead them as they navigate the wilderness. Now you fast forward to the moment of Christ Christ's temptation and what happens he comes up out of the water in baptism the one who was sent by God to deliver his people and as he comes up out of the water he is led by the spirit into the wilderness the apostle Paul gives a summary of the Israelite story in first Corinthians chapter 10 in fact he uses it as a warning to the church in Corinth he says this I don't want you to be unaware brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the, in the seas. Like, man, we had some amazing moments, didn't we? Everybody coming up out of the water, everybody enjoying the applause, everybody loving the worship. It says, and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. What? Well, and, and just quick, that's just like, hey, we all heard the same message. We're all in the same community. We got some EC groups. 
We're there in the room together. We're, we're part of this together. It says, nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. They did not make it out of the wilderness, so they followed a journey that we followed, and they find themselves where we find ourselves, but they didn't get through. Overthrown. So they're saved and set free, but they died wandering 40 years in the wilderness, never reaching the purposes of God. And so the apostle Paul uses this story and says, hey, I just want to show you a couple of things that you got to be on the lookout for because these are the things that took them down. And he says, hey, don't be idolaters as some of them were. Uh, don't indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. Don't put Christ to the test as they did and were destroyed by serpents. He says, ah, oh, don't do these things. So now, when Jesus goes back into the wilderness, he is not on a hike. He's not. Somebody asked me yesterday if I wanted to do the rim to rim Grand Canyon hike. Are you crazy? <laughs> do I look like the type of guy who's built for that sort of action? No, Jesus is not just heading out into the wilderness on a recreational journey. He is heading back to the place where the Israelites were overthrown and Jesus is establishing himself as the better Moses, as the true deliverer, as fully God, fully man, by whom and for whom all things were made and created. And he goes back to this place of historical failure to say, hey, I know that you were no match for the devil here, but I'm gonna go back into the wilderness. I've got a match with the devil. I've got some unsettled, unfinished business. I'm going to take 40 days to undo what was tied up in 40 years. And I'm going to show you it's possible to survive the wilderness. Jesus gets into the wilderness. 40 days doesn't eat. The devil comes to him. I think this is really interesting. This is the first face-to-face -face encounter between the devil and Jesus. This is wild stuff. I think it's a grudge match. You don't forget who the devil is. His other name is Lucifer. He was an angel in heaven. He was the angel responsible for worship. And, and, and so the devil had pride in his heart. He failed the tests. He got thrown down to earth, cast out of heaven, and has been waiting since the beginning to get at Jesus. Imagine you're the devil, and in Genesis chapter 3, we're not putting the verse up there, but after Adam and Eve sinned, uh, God says, hey, here's the punishment to the devil. I'm going to send somebody through the seed of the woman. I'm going to send a child. I'm going to send a person that will eventually be born, and they will crush the devil's head. That's like saying, hey, just wait. Somebody bigger is going to come and beat you up. And the devil has been waiting thousands of years to meet his match. Thousands of years to meet the one who it's been prophesied will take you down. And he tried throughout history to take Jesus down. He tried throughout history raising up kings to take out God's people, um, tried to take the seed of Abraham and tried to get the seed of Isaac and tried to get the seed of Jacob and Joseph and David. There was infant genocide. There was political upheaval. Nothing worked. Jesus was born. Now he's a grown man. And the devil's like, all right, let's see what this guy's really made of. And as true cowards do, he waits until he's tired and hungry and says, hey, what do you got? The tempter comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I th there's like a little bit of jealousy there in the devil. There's a little bit of let's see if you're really as good as they say you are. I'm, I'm curious to know if you've really got what it takes. Now, I think the devil's asking him because the devil knows he did not have what it takes. That's why he got cast out of heaven. And that's the difference. The devil was cast down. Jesus was called out to a purpose. Well, let me just see if you really are who they say you are. Jesus answered, man, it's written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So, so the devil is like, hey, psst, you must be so hungry. It's been 40 days. You look a little famished. 
looking a little thin? You need a sandwich? Need some food? Need some bread? And he tempts Jesus with what we call the lust of the flesh. He's tempt, he, there's no doubt after 40 days, the humanity in Christ has this overwhelming desire to have something to eat. And the devil says, hey, why don't you let your desire drive? Why don't you let your desire take over? And I'm telling you, the devil will come to you in moments of weakness, and he'll try to get you to let your desires drive. Man, I'm so hungry. I need this so bad. And you're driven by your desires. I want this. I'm going to pursue this. If it feels good, I deserve this. And Paul warns the, the, the people in Corinth about this. He says, do not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. Like, this is not the first time you're being tempted by desires. People have been getting tempted to let their desires drive for all of human history. So if you are in the room today and you maybe came up out of the water, you've professed a relationship with Christ, you've been trying your best to live with Jesus, but you still find you've got desires that are controlling every once in a while, you're not alone. It's happened. Can I encourage you? You can't let your desires drive you. Your feelings will lie to you. They cannot be trusted. They are a great feature on your dashboard. They are a terrible pilot to have in the driver's seat, navigating the direction and destiny of your life. Do not be driven by your feelings and your desires. Remember, the the last thing God said was, this is my beloved son, with him I'm well pleased. The first thing the devil says is, if you are the son of God, It's crazy, hey? Like, God speaks once. He establishes something with one word. Hey, that's my son. I'm pleased with him. And this this ought to just give you a bit of a contrast between the power of God and how pathetic our enemy is. Because God only has to say it once. And the devil's like, over and over. He's like, yeah, but if you are, and if you are, and if you are, and some of you are dealing with the devil on repeat in your mind right now. You have a good moment. You're like, man, I'm so confident in who God says I am. But then all of a sudden the devil's in there saying, hey, if you're really a son or daughter, you wouldn't be struggling with that. If God really loved you, you wouldn't be in that living situation. If your faith was real, you wouldn't have that thing you're trying to conquer. If your baptism meant anything, you would not have struggled with that habit this week if you were a really good Christian and the devil likes to get iffy with you because he wants to create some doubt and confusion and wants you to question am I really who God said I am and then out of our desire for affirmation and our desire for approval and acceptance we do crazy things and we channel we 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 cannot control our desires and so we run with lustful enthusiasm at things that leave us empty The devil's always going to try and confuse and distort what God says about you. When you're in a bad place, he's going to come at you with lies. If, 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 if. Now, the irony is that the devil tries to attack Jesus' identity, which, by the way, when the devil says, if you are the son, the devil knows exactly who Jesus is. He knows. He knows he's the son of God. If is just there to create confusion. And the devil will never attack somebody that he doesn't already have. He's strategic. He's not going to waste his time attacking somebody who's not living for God anyways. That ought to be a bit of encouragement. He only goes after Jesus because he knows he doesn't have Jesus. And so if you find yourself wrestling with insecurity, questioning your identity, you've got these lies from the devil playing over and over and over about your value and your worth, let me encourage you, it would not be happening if you already belonged to the devil. But because God has a purpose and a plan on your life, the devil knows who you are and he's trying to get you trapped up in insecurity to derail you from your purpose. He doesn't have you. And who are you? You're a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Listen, God had just told everybody who Jesus was. And Jesus now is like, man, no, I remember what God said about me. I got a purpose. He's proud of me. He's, he's, I'm his son. Okay, the irony, though, is that The devil's trying to tempt Jesus with bread. (laughs) Jesus is running a carb deficit. No. No, why is it ironic? 
Because the Bible tells us that Jesus is the bread of life. So the devil is trying to tempt Jesus with what Jesus already is. And he'll try to tempt you with things that you already are. Hey, run after this desire to get approval. No, no, you've already been approved. Run after this desire to, to, to get affirmation. Run after this desire to help you feel significant. No, 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 listen. You already have what you need from your heavenly father. What does that mean? When the devil starts playing those if lies over in your head, you can say, hey, you can't tempt me with love. I know I'm loved by my father. You can't tempt me with value because I know Jesus gave his life for me and my value is infinite and unmeasurable. You can't tempt me with approval. God is pleased with me. You can't tempt me with what I already am. And so what do we do about our desires? Psalm 37, 4, take delight in the Lord. Let him drive and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You'll have good desires when he drives. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it's written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him. It's also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So the devil's like, hey, you're the son of God, right? Yeah. Jump. Nope. No, like, like if you jump, the angels will grab you or you can just fly away or something. Like imagine if you if you jump if you're really the son of God, why don't you just jump off and prove it? Why don't you prove it? Well, that's not that's not what God has planned. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Just just Jump off and do it your own way. What we're seeing here is the devil trying to tempt Jesus with the pride of life that you can do things your own way. Don't let pride drive. Don't let pride drive. When pride is driving, everything is a comparison and a competition with somebody else. When pride is driving, you're always striving to be better instead of just allowing Jesus to be in control. When pride drives, you're committed to doing things your own way. When pride drives, you start picking, choosing parts of the Bible to obey and follow. When pride drives, you're easily offended. When pride drives, you're entitled. Uh, that's the devil. He's appealing to all this. Hey, aren't you entitled to angels just helping you? Shouldn't you be able just to jump and they'll take care of you? Aren't you the son of God? No, when pride drives, nobody really knows you. You're too good to get help. He's saying, hey, hey, just do this your own way. Jesus says, nah, no, I'm not going to test God like that. Pride always needs to be in control. It's no trust. It's no faith. Don't test God. The, the devil wants us to let pride drive. He will lure us into believing that we somehow know better. That's what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. They thought, man, we could do what we want, when we want. We can be our own driver, driven by our desires to be in control. Do not let pride drive. Man, the devil must have been so frustrated, hey? Jesus is two for two. Devil's got to be looking at him like, man, this guy is better than I thought. I was sure he'd go for the pride thing. That's just cool. Can I understand if he didn't want the bread? What I think really drove the devil crazy is that Jesus is passing every test that the devil failed. And then he takes him to the top of the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He says, man, I'll give you all of this. You just have to bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus would not let his desires and the flesh drive him. He would not let his pride drive him. And here the devil is appealing to the lust of the eyes. Hey, it looks good. You need it. You deserve it. Driven by stuff. Driven by possessions. Driven by, man, the devil's saying, listen, I'll give you everything you see. You just have to worship me. All you have to do is bow down before me. And there are a lot of people bowing down before false gods trying to get things that if they would seek first his kingdom, he would add to them anyways. 
Paul says it like this, don't be idolaters, don't worship other gods like some of them did. The people sat down to eat and drink and then rose up to play. Not only is this about worshiping the devil, I believe Paul connects it here, worshiping convenience, worshiping comfort, worshiping immediacy. Hey, you can have this without the pain. You can have this without paying the price. You can have this and you won't have to wait. You can have it right now. And we worship convenience and we worship comfort. If it's going to cost me and be uncomfortable for me, I don't really want it. Guess what? Christianity will cost you every now and then. We'll say things like, man, Christianity, like you, you can have life in Christ. It's his free gift to you. And it's true. He gives it to you, but it will cost you your life. Because if you keep trying to drive, you're not really living with Jesus. And the enemy is offering Jesus, you can have all this, no cross. Jesus is like, no, nah, it's not worth it. Now, you know, what makes, you know what makes all that worth it is that after the cross, I've got it anyways. And when I do what God called me to do, I'll have everything my eyes could ever want anyways. When I do what God's asked me to do, I'll have everything I need anyways. And, and, and the challenge today is like, hey, Nobody gets to fulfilling their purpose without a little prep on the way. And you might hit a space where you're like, man, this is good, and I'm really thriving. Guess what? They'll be, you'll keep circling back into wilderness moments. There will continue to be tests. There will continue to be temptations. God wants to know that you've got the resolve and the character to stand up to the test. Now, here is the challenge. Jesus is not just our example. He's our savior. And if I just told you today that he's your example, you'd walk out thinking, I have to do everything that Jesus did. Guess what? You can't. You can't. You can't when you're hungry and tired and, and, and alone and struggling. You're not going to, you're not going to like pass up and be strong in temptation all the time. You can't do that in your own strength. Jesus is not just an example, he's a savior. And here in this spiritual battle, in this holy grudge match between the devil and our Christ, Jesus goes, hey, I want you to see that everything he throws at me, I can withstand. Now, every other religious leader will tell you, live a good life and offer that good life to God. Every other religion will tell you, live righteously and maybe God will accept you. The difference in Christianity is that Jesus says, I'll do everything. I'll pay the price. I'll navigate the temptation. I'll be strong when you're weak. I'll be strength when you don't have what it takes to keep going. I will live a righteous life and I'll give it to you because you can't do this by yourself. And Jesus models for us and is advertising, not just in it, he's advertising for us in his resistance of temptation. Hey, the same strength you saw me take in the temptation of lust, the same strength you saw me have in the temptation of pride, the same strength you saw me have in the temptation of selfishness and the lust of the eyes, man, that same power, that same resolve is available when you're in me. And with that, the devil left him. And the angels came and attended him. Just as quickly as the devil came, he went. I want to encourage you just as quickly as maybe you got up out of the water and stepped into something that felt like a test. Just that quickly, God can take you into a great space again. Just that quickly, the devil can leave. Just that quickly, the miracle can happen. Just that quickly, the answer to prayer can come. Just that quickly. Then the devil left. I want to pray for you because I know that God is leading our church somewhere beautiful. I know that what we saw last week, like I mentioned, is like just the next best Sunday. We're, we're here today. It's already better. Next week will be better than that. I know that in your life, he's leading you from glory to glory and strength to strength. But you don't go from mountain to mountain. You go through valleys to get to new mountains. And so we're going to do that journey together. And it's going to mean supporting one another and standing with one another and reminding each other constantly, hey, make sure you let the Holy Spirit drive. Who's driving? Turn to your neighbor and say, who's driving? That ought, be, that ought to be a good question. The next time somebody brings a concern to you or a prayer request to you or there's a struggle to you, you ought to turn and say, hey, who's driving? Do it again. Go to the other side. Who's driving? 
Who's driving? Would you stand with me from the front to the back in both rooms? Come on, Southwest, do it again. Who's driving? Who's driving? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Jesus went through it to let you know that you and I could too. But we can't do it on our own. We only navigate trials, temptations, tests by having a relationship with him. And so my first prayer today, Lord, is for everybody in the room who's felt like they're in the middle of a situation. God, you know the needs in the room in the Southwest. You know what's going on here in the Southeast. God, we pray right now that you would strengthen our faith. God, thank you that we have you not just as an example, but as a savior who says, I'll be what you need in the middle of those moments so we can navigate them together. Thank you that there's a plan and a purpose. But right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I wonder if there's some people in the room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've never made that decision. In fact, um, you're not just fighting for the steering wheel. You're not letting him in. Like, you've just been in complete control. And you know it's not working. There's a void in your heart. There's been some emptiness. There's a struggle. I'm going to count to three. And if that's you, and you know it's time to get your life right with Christ, I just want you to slip your hand up so we can pray together. If that's you, both rooms, one, Two, it's time to make a decision for Jesus. Trust him with your life. Three, go ahead, slip up your hand. Stop trying to be in control. Amazing, thank you, thank you, thank you. There's hands here in the southeast, I see. There's hands in the southwest, your campus pastors see. If you put your hand up, I'm gonna ask you, you can put it down, but I want you to repeat a prayer after me. Maybe you raised a hand, maybe you are making this decision in your heart in both rooms. Let's pray this prayer. EC, let's say it together. Say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do life without you. Come into my heart, forgive me my sins. I trust you with my future.